today my guest is Jane Thompson. She has experienced an NDE and prior to her NDE, she was a realtor and then she made a sharp 180 to become a spiritually transformed individual who now is a spiritual mentor and coach. Welcome, Jane. Thank you for having me, Sylvia. You had a very serious bacterial infection, which caused your body to shut down. Can you tell us about that day when this all started? Sure. This was August 22nd, 2008. And I hadn't been feeling very well the night before. Um, but when I woke up that morning, it was the sun was just coming up. So I don't know exactly what time it was, but I was burning up with a high fever. I later found out it was 106 degrees, um, but I was just burning up. I was in so much pain all over my body that I couldn't even move to get the phone to call someone. And so I was slipping in and out of consciousness and then I finally was able to reach for the phone at about 7.30 that morning. And I called a family member and I said, something's wrong. And she came and got me and we went to the hospital and it took them a while to diagnose. Uh, we eventually found out that I had a kidney stone that was lodged in my ureter and my entire blood supply was infected and I had gone into septic shock. For those of you who don't know, septic shock uh, can be fatal. And obviously for you on this day, it was. Tell us about that. It was. Septic shock has, I believe it's a 35 or 40 percent mortality rate. So it's high. Mm -hmm. um, and I... I could feel that I was dying throughout that morning. Um, my NDE didn't happen until 1.20 that afternoon, but I could feel myself kind of going out and coming back in um, during that time when they were trying to diagnose. How did you know you were dying? What were the sensations in your body? It was, um, you know how sometimes you can zone out or speak Face out a little bit where you lose your sense of where you are. It was like that, but times 1000, where I was just completely leaving my body. And I didn't understand what it was at the time, but it was my soul stepping out. And then I would step back in, but I was just becoming completely disconnected. And I have since talked to a lot of people who feel, and I agree with this, that sometimes when we are in so much physical pain, our soul will journey out. And I, so I was doing that that morning in and out. Um, and I remember wanting to be out and it wasn't just because of the pain. It was because of the peace that was happening when I was out. And I wasn't even going out into the light yet. I was just exiting the physical body. And it felt wonderful to be able to do that. So I'm assuming that you weren't scared during this process. Did you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm dying. I need to get back. I need help. Or was it more like a euphoric feeling like this isn't as bad as I thought. I'm feeling better now. It was a little of both. Um, because when I was in my body, I was experiencing that pain and that high fever and not knowing yet what was going on and if or how they could treat me. Um, and that brought up that fear. And so when I was in that state, I was scared of going in and out because I didn't understand exactly what was going on and why I was going back and forth. Mm -hmm. But when I was out, I loved it. It felt you know, it's a little cliche, but it did feel more like home to be out of my physical body, even though I hadn't completely passed at that point. Wow. So when you say it felt like home, I've heard people say that, and I've always wondered, what does that feel like? It feels very natural. There's nothing foreign about that feeling. 
I wouldn't have really understood what that even meant unless I had actually done it. But it just, now that I'm back in my body and in this physical realm, in the physical world, this all really feels like an illusion and like a dream. Whereas when I was out and had that sense of home, it was really just a sense of this is natural or this is what fits. It's the way it's meant to be is the way I would describe it. Thank you for sharing that with me. So moving along, it's now between 1 and 2 p.m. in the afternoon. What happened? So I had gone in for a CT scan. At this point, they still hadn't diagnosed me. They hadn't given me any pain medication. They didn't even give me an IV yet because they didn't know what they were going to need to do for me. Mm -hmm. So um, I was in for a CT scan and they were doing an IV at that point. And I remember at that time I was, when I was leaving my body, I was staying out for longer periods. And I remember as the nurse was putting in the IV, I was dehydrated. So she was probably having a harder time doing it. Um, but it was very painful and that pain, the shock of the pain was pulling me back to my body. And I remember being mad at her. Um, even though I knew she was trying to help me, I was really trying to exit at that point. But every time she tried to get the needle in, it would pull me back in. And I finally told her, I said, get the needle in. And I was so, I couldn't take any more of it as that had completed. I was on the hospital gurney and they took me to a waiting area in the emergency room um, to wait for the doctor to see what was next. And that's when my NDE began, um, truly began the transition out. And it first started where everything around me was very heightened. All the um, sensory input around me was very heightened. And I remember the clock on the wall, I could hear it ticking and it was like a loud thump with every second. And there were some children down the hall in a little waiting area. And it seemed like they were so loud. And I said something to a family member that was standing next to me like, oh, they're, those kids are so loud. And she looked at me and she said, Jane, they're actually being really good. They're not that loud. And that's when I realized I was having a different experience than everyone else. And at that point, I started to convulse and the pain was horrendous. And um, the heat, I was still very hot from the fever. And when I started to convulse, I shut my eyes and I started to feel everything internally. I could feel the veins on my head. It felt like I could see them popping out as I was convulsing. And I thought, I can't take this pain anymore. This is too much pain. And right then I started to go very internal. Um, I shut out everyone and everything that was around me. I, I just completely lost awareness of it. And I started doing this, it was like a scan of what was going on inside my body. And it was like I was watching a movie of what was going on inside my body. And I was just looking around and I could see the blood pumping and my internal organs. And I was looking around and then I had this realization, just calmly, I, I thought to myself, I'm dying and I kept looking around and, and then I went, this is what it feels like to die. And I felt very peaceful about it. But then I did have a, a brief moment of fear that came up. And then I internally, this internal voice again was, no, that's a little dramatic, isn't it? But then I came right back to, well, this is what it feels like to die. And right then is when I... Um, completely popped out of my body. And my next memory is being on top of the ceiling in the hospital room that I was in, in the ER, looking down at my body. When you were looking down at your body, 
how did you identify yourself? Because when I first looked down, I recognized myself. Um, and I, I thought, how am I up here? But I see myself down there. It didn't make sense to me. And the more I had some time to orient, um, the more I could look at my body and I could tell that it, there was no life in it. And that's when everything started coming together for me of, oh, I died and, and here I am up here and that's the shell of me down there. Okay, so my question and perhaps my audience question is, did you have family members, children yet down on earth? And were you thinking about that at the moment or was that a far away thought? For the most part, it was a far away thought. I didn't have children yet and I wasn't married. I did have a very serious boyfriend um, and he was there right next to my body right next to me and a family another family member was on the other side of me um, but they had been pushed to the side as medical personnel was coming in but i honestly i wasn't concerned about them i wasn't caught up in in what was going on in that in that hospital room at that point i was just an observer that, um, that brings me uh, some comfort because I feel so attached to my family members and my children, and I can't imagine being right in the position that you were in. I might imagine that I'd be scrambling to get back. Yes, and I've since become a mother, so I can completely relate to what you're saying. And I've thought about that too, of if I had my daughter at the time, how would that be different? And I do think there would be something different about it. And you do hear from other near-death experiencers that they do choose to come back for their children. And so I think everyone has a unique story. But I've also talked to other NDEers who have come back and they had kids at the time. And there's just this piece where you just no, everyone and everything is cared for and everything is going to be okay. Okay, so you're on the ceiling looking at your body. What happens next? So after I got oriented and I understood what had happened and what was going on, I was just looking as an observer and it was, um, I was detached from it and I was a part of it all at the same time. And I was just looking at it almost like I was watching a movie, a very personal movie. And then I just slowly started floating backwards and up. And it was very gentle. It was almost like I was gliding backwards. And as I was floating up, um, I could no longer see the room that I was in. Now I was seeing what looked like the hospital but I didn't see a roof and I didn't see walls. What I saw were these little balls of white buzzing energy. And they were all connected by this thin, um, clear string. And what that string looked exactly like is if you ever catch a spider web in the sunlight just right and you see the way it glistens. That's what I saw, and I knew what it was at the time, but it took me coming back into my body to be able to describe what that was. Those are souls. I was seeing souls, and um, they were all connected, and that was oneness. And I remember thinking, why are they all buzzing around so much? They seemed so busy to me, and it didn't make a lot of sense to me why there was so much running around, and then I just continued to float backwards more and more until I was in what I guess I would describe as space. Um, and then that's when I immediately went into the tunnel. So tell us about the tunnel. So the tunnel for me was like being on a roller coaster ride at an amusement park. Um, it was black, it was dark, but it wasn't scary. Um, it was very fast. 
And it really was like, you know, when you go on a roller coaster and you're having a great time, you would just put your hands up and scream because you're having so much fun. That's the same sensation or the feeling that I had. The tunnel ride for me was very quick. It was enough for me to register that it happened, but it was very quick for me. And then I immediately just almost like plopped out of the tunnel into the white light. Nice. The white light. Hence, that's why your programs and your workshops are called white light. Okay, I'll get to that later. So you're in the white light. I could just imagine. Tell us about it. The white light. Well, coming out of a black tunnel into this white light, it again, I, I needed to adjust a little bit um, to the brightness of it, because although it's peacefully bright, it's, there's an intensity about it too. And um, once I got used to it, I started looking around a little bit and I instantly felt, the first thing that I instantly felt was unconditional love. I had never in my entire life felt love like that. And even now I'm a mom and that's, you know, the love we have for our child, that's probably the closest you can get to true unconditional love. But that love doesn't even compare to the unconditional love that I felt in the light. And I just started soaking it in. It, you know, if I had a body, probably my gesture would have just been, oh, and I just, I started soaking it in. And the next thing I felt was peace, peace like I've never felt before. And the next thing I felt after that was I, I started to get an awareness of um, emotional wounds that I had experienced during my life in my body. And um, they started getting filled in. This white light was healing those wounds. And um, I felt like I was becoming whole again, that maybe parts of me were missing. Um, and this white light was healing me and making me whole and making me complete. And during that process, I started realizing that I wasn't separate from this white light, that I was the white light too. And we were just reuniting in a lot of ways. Okay. So would you say, just to help me understand, when you were on earth, were you part of that white light and you just couldn't identify it? Or did you become aware once you were in the light? I, there's a little bit of separation from it while we're on earth. I, it's what is always been at my core, um, but things like ego and, um, you know, not really being aware of that when I was in my body. So it's always been there, but being in physical form created a, a distance or a separation, even though we're still a part of it. That's that, that really abstract concept that's hard to describe. We are the white light, but I didn't realize it until I actually got in the white light. I've heard some people describe it like a veil that we can't really, we don't have that awareness here because there's a veil. Do you see it like that too? Yes. And I think that veil is ego. Mm -hmm. I think it's ego. And I think it's um, our brains limit us so much. And when we, in our bodies, just the physical limitations of you know, we're contained here. And so I think that veil is ego gets stripped away and the limitations of intellect get stripped away. And we no longer have these bodies to deal with. And so once that's out of the picture, out of the way, then we do just become fully a part of it again. Jane, you just um, shed some light, <laughs> no pun intended, on something for me because I thought about the veil and I've thought about the ego, but I never put those two thoughts together ever. This is the first time 
and realize that the ego and the intellect can potentially be that veil stopping us from experiencing our existence to its full light form maybe yeah wow that's great thanks for sharing that because the ego is energy the ego our ego has energy to it and our thoughts have energy and so we can create uh, a cloud in between wow that's great. Like a weather system where we can't see the other side. It's like, oh, it's too stormy. Interesting. So do you think, um, these are questions that I haven't prepared you for, so don't feel like you have to answer them, but do you think that we come to this earth in part so that we can work on parts of our ego? Yes. I think that's what, you know, our ego is, a great teacher. It shows us a lot of um, the areas that we can heal. And I do think that the reason we're here on earth and in our bodies is to love and, and to learn. And the ego is a wonderful teacher if we, if we allow it to be. Right. Prior to getting sick and having this NDE, without getting into too much detail, would you say on a scale of one to 10, how happy were you? And how do you think your previous life may have influenced it or did it influence it at all for you to have this NDE? I thought I was happy. I don't know. I was, I loved to work. That was my thing. I loved to work. And because I was in real estate, I worked seven days a week and morning to late in the night. And so I was very occupied by that. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to think about whether I was happy or not, but I was very wrapped up in all of that. And what I know now that I didn't know then is, although I had a lot of friends and I had a serious boyfriend and you know family, they weren't heart-centered relationships. Um, and there, you know, my heart was pretty closed off because of conditioning and things that had happened along the way. Um, so, you know, I can compare it now and I can say that was pretty empty, but at the time on a scale of one to 10, how happy was I? I probably thought I was maybe a six or a seven. I think I always knew there was more. Um, yeah. but I, I was just kind of coasting, I would say. So this experience cracked you open, opened you up to the white light. And I just want to go back to the white light for a second. So this is where you were and now here you are. This white light, did you meet relatives that had passed on? Did you meet angels, beings of light? I didn't have enough time there to do all of that. I wish I would have. Um, I, for some reason that wasn't meant for me. Um, as I was, you know, experiencing this replenishment and this healing from the white light, I did start to notice what felt like a crowd starting to come toward me. And it was a friendly crowd. It was a loving crowd, but I still don't know really who that was, but I think that was my team and loved ones who had previously passed over that were coming to greet me was what it felt like. Wow. But I didn't have enough time to check that out. So would you say that this white light not only healed you, but infused you with wisdom, new wisdom and insights? Oh, yes. And uh, new spiritual abilities. And it's, it, it changed. It, it blew me wide open is what I, I tell everyone. that It changed everything about me and it mostly what it did was being you know being out of my body and then going into the light i had this 360 degree perspective that i had never experienced before and that's ultimately what this gave me and i brought as you know i came back into my body with as much as of that as a person probably can but yeah it changed everything 
Okay. So you were a realtor, you came back and now suddenly you're a spiritual mentor. Did it, did you start right away or did you have to recalibrate and did you go through a period of time where you had to learn how to be this new person? It was a process. Um, when I first came back, you know, I didn't even, I didn't even know that that was a near death experience. Um, I knew that I had gone into the light and all of those things, but I didn't have a name for it. And I tried to talk to my doctor about it, which that, that was a mistake. I told him <laughs> I went into the light. And he, he laughed at me, which now I can laugh about that. But at the time that really hurt because it was so, it was an experience that I wanted to share with people. So that wasn't great. And then I talked to um, my boyfriend that was there and then another family member that was there and watched the whole thing happen. And they didn't want to talk about it. I think they were pretty traumatized by what had happened and they were just glad I was back. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have anybody to talk to the, not so much my doctor, but the other two people that I really would have trusted with this story and with this information, I couldn't have dialogue with them. And so I kept it to myself and that's a lot to process without a support system. Where did and, you finally, oh, sorry. Where did, where did you finally find solace? Well, it took me some time. I have to be honest that I, um, I had a hard time leaving the house because I was such an empath that I felt everything and I was overwhelmed by it and I was having mediumship experiences and that really scared me. And so the only place I felt okay for a couple of years was at home. And um, I went out only when I absolutely had to. And it wasn't, it was, it was a sad time really because I didn't know what was going on and I was pretty isolated. Um, once I figured out what had happened and I started doing some research, things started to unfold. And once I understood, um, that's when I started being able to reach out to other people who might understand and who had been further along the path that might be able to help me. And that's when things started getting better. But at home in my own little energetically controlled space um, and when I would meditate, that, those were the only times I really felt okay for a couple of years right after my NDE. When you said that you felt sadness, I almost felt the wave of sadness that you felt. It, yeah, that's unfortunate that you had to feel that way. But I wonder if that sadness didn't drive you to search for answers. It did. And a lot of people, you know, people don't always talk about it. And sometimes people don't want to hear about it. But a lot of people who have had NDEs experience sadness. And it's because when you're in that light, that's the best place you could ever want to be. And then you get thrust back into this world. That's harsh. It's very harsh. And when you have these new qualities of being an empath and all of these other things. And I was 34 when I had my NDE. So I'd had a pretty good number of years as an adult not having um, the experience of being an empath or a medium. And, and that's a very big contrast. And it is sad. And that's why I think part of why I went through that sadness is so I can do what I do now. And I can talk about it and be frank about it and say, yeah, it was really awful the first couple of years. And let me help you with that. Mm hmm. I think that um, based on the comments that I get on my channel, um, and I'm grateful for the comments, I hear a lot of people say, I wish I could have an NDE. I wish I could ha be an empath. And what would you say to someone like that? I, I don't want to discourage them. But what is the reality of, of that? I think people who wish they could have an NDE 
want to experience the light. They want to experience the love and the peace, everything that those of us who have been there, everything that we talk about, they want to experience it firsthand. And I, I get it. I totally get that. And I think that's why people love to watch your interviews and people will oftentimes tell me, I feel like I'm addicted to watching um, stories about NDEs. And it's because every time I talk about that white light, it's coming through. And so when you watch an interview, you are experiencing that white light. And I think that's why people love to watch these interviews. So I understand why people say they wish they could have an NDE and um gives them hope it gives them faith now i have a question for you what do you think about bringing the white light right here on earth what about shining um acknowledging uh, being more aware what about bringing that veil down is that what you do in your work now that's exactly what i do and it's um healing i do all white light healing I, I remember when I was in the early stages of integrating my after effects, I was talking to a woman and she said, you can move energy, Jane. That's, you, that's your gift. You can move energy. And I thought, what? I don't even know. That sounds cool. I don't even know what that means. But she said, one day you're going to be able to fill up a room with that white light and you should start practicing and learning how to do that. And I thought that would be cool. And so I, that's what I do now. And I, when I work with people, we move out the more stagnant or lower vibrational energy that could have been caused by trauma, conditioning, ego, um, you know, just living life and then fill it right back in with white light because we do have access to it. It's just a little harder to get to because of some of the limitations that we have. Well, I think it's just beautiful and wonderful that you're dedicating your life work towards helping people experience the white light and let go and shed some of the unnecessary filters between them and the white light. And I wanna thank you so much for coming today. And I want to let everyone know that all the details of how you can get a hold of Jane is going to be in the show notes in the description of this video. Her website's going to be there. She has a beautiful display there of all of her workshops that you can take and watch and connect with Jane. Also, please feel free to comment below and ask any questions or comment. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for being here today, Jane. Thank you.